This is Flotilla Friday, uh, September 17th, 2021. I would like to say something. Last week we had this long, really interesting chat about stories and storytelling and I came out kind of negative at the end about things. And it seemed to me, I was like pushing back on Pete's quite eloquent description of how almost every interaction amongst us is a kind of story. And as I was thinking more about what my, what, you know, sent my like gray cells into like, um, I, uh, and I've been, re I've been reading this big history book. I just realized Pete's absolutely right that we almost don't have anything but stories. But the words, I still think the word story needs to maintain some meaning and not just become like everything's a story. Then it's like, well, what are we talking about now? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. quantum computing. <laughs> so I just want, it seemed that I was really, I felt I was being really Mr. You know, cranky pants at the end there. So I didn't think so. Well, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I didn't take it that way either, Bill. You know, and I and I thought your point at the time about it being, you know, let's if we want to start thinking about everything as being stories, <clears throat> then maybe some new words would be nice to delineate one type of storytelling from another type of storytelling. That's what I hear you saying. Yeah, I have a friend of mine who was a professional storyteller, and he really unearthed a whole bunch of native indigenous stories and old Japanese ghost stories, which I must tell you are super scary. <laughs> <laughs> now the Japanese have a spare way of like, if you've ever read a Japanese short story, they're like, oh my God, there's like almost no words here. <laughs> but uh, so there is a thing that's storytelling that you know, if you're in front of a judge and you get your hand raised, yeah, I don't think we're going to you know, talk about Cinderella here. I think. <laughs> Although I did have a student once question me about lying. Well, I was talking about something and he said, well, that would be lying. I said, yeah, it would. I said, and, and me, you know, as a human, I can make that choice. He said, you know, I said, even in a courtroom. He said, but he said, yeah, no, well, yeah, I, there could be a lot of consequences, <laughs> but it's still up to me to choose. He was just floored, I think. <laughs> the, the, um, that, that reminds me of our last president um, who, who got, who, who did a, a fair amount of lying, but a lot of what he did was actually just say whatever he thought he, you know, sounded good or felt like saying at the time or, or something like that. So they weren't even lies. A lot of most of his things were just, you know, just what he thought sounded good. <laughs> well, I would say he has a human. He's a, he's a, you know, he's damaged in terms of his yeah, uh, significantly yeah. personal personality and mental capacity. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's fair. So Google auto captioned uh, the YouTube video and translated it to 108 other languages, which blows my mind. Oh, wow. What YouTube wow. video are we talking about? Uh, last week's Flotilla Friday oh. call. <clears throat> and then it broadcast it to the world and sent it into outer space. Just <laughs> no, I don't know about that. <laughs> to, let, to let the vehicle that's just passing Pluto going. I don't know, man. I think we should like take a lift. <laughs> the, the, the other weird thing, yeah. The other weird thing is that, you know, the first time I loaded it is zero views, you know, viewed zero times. And I'm like, okay, so Google has just proactively translated it to, you know, Azerbaijani, you know, just so, just in case somebody wanders by and goes like, dang, I wish I knew what these English people were saying, you know. <laughs> And I, I uh, shoot, I made a list of them. I didn't post the list on the on the chat. Um, I'm looking at all these, like, there's like, 
language codes in there I don't recognize, you know, because I'm I'm pretty good with my language codes, you know, the first top 50 or whatever like that. And I like I know what that is because I've been around the internet for a long time. But I'm like, that's a language, you know? So so I like dig into the captions and like, yep, it's a language. While I'm thinking about it, let me post this list of uh, languages. So I wanted to ask Wendy, did you want to say any more about this little thing you're looking that you said we need to look into? Well, yeah. So my question, thank you for asking, I guess. <laughs> it's a good thing to explore just that. Um, I think my question, if people aren't familiar with that, that particular company, is to ask um, what people's impressions are of hollow chain blockchain the new infrastructure that is trying to be built. Vincent and I talked a little bit about this yesterday. I also met with Zeke this week. Um, and he and I talked a lot about Holochain after our, we were both, we both wanted to connect after last week's call. So that was good. And I'll be talking to him again later today. And then in between, I met this person, Molly Sargent, who's from, you know, who's working on this project, Quisnet. So I was, it just raised all these questions for me and having not, you know, not having a technical background in these areas, it was more, you know, it can be a five minute conversation. We don't have to make this the cornerstone of today's conversation if that's not of interest to people. But I'm currently asking the questions of what, what are really the differences? What's emerging? And ultimately, do people feel like, because it's really kind of seems to me like an infrastructure being, a new infrastructure being built for the internet, do people feel like some of these competing projects will have to figure themselves out? Like we can't have, can we have competing projects or not? Because it's going to be a new infrastructure or will ever, will one kind of emerge as the winner and we'll all build on that, you know? So I was just kind of a philosophical, maybe more conversation than a technical conversation. Well, that's a great question. Because this history book I'm reading about how the world became modern in the 19th century. I'd mentioned this to Pete the other day, but basically what we've done in the 19th century is take the ideas, the kind of enlightenment and uh, Adam Smith and all these kind of capitalist, liberal market-based ideas and thrown away all the other stuff that those people said about human welfare and decided that, you know, we'll just do markets, okay. right? So now I have some, I have like sleep apnea and I have to get, you know, I have to do some stuff, but now I can't get any equipment because there's like a supply shortage. And, mm -hmm. You know, so the whole thing is like, yeah, it works great till it doesn't work at all, you know? Yeah. Um, so, Bill, and I, Bill and I were talking about something else this week um, um, about files and directories and hierarchies and stuff like that. And you made this great observation that um, originally there weren't, it's going to sound crazy or, or like hard to imagine even, but there weren't directories. There weren't, um, you know, you didn't have like directories that you give the files in. There were just files um, and links between the files. Um, so this came up in the context of, of uh, Massive Wiki. Um, because we're using Obsidian, Obsidian has a really nice file explorer with directories and stuff like that. And it, it's this attractive trap where you go, I'm going to organize my pages <laughs> into these file folders. And then, and then pretty soon you're like, but I want this page to be in, you know, what, what file folder does it go into? And I want it to be in two file folders. And all of a sudden you've, re you know, uh, recapitulated all of the problems with directories, you know, instead of linking. So uh, Wendy Elford, I've been telling her, like, please don't worry about the directories, just link, link a lot, you know, link, you know, and links are perfect. Um, so Bill's like, yeah, you know, and, and so then the, the the original folks that had files, you know, they said, well, yeah, I guess we could add these, you know, directory things. <laughs> but then what happens, 
they they weren't thinking that was the do all and be all right but like you know five years later 10 years later 20 years later people are kind of discovering how am i going to use this thing oh this is the organizational structure these original inventors came up with thank god they had some plan for helping us organize stuff right file folders and, and directories and stuff it's a, a replication of physical ways of filing things right they're not very useful in in computers actually and they're they're a pain in the pain in the rear so so then a similar question came up kind of on the thursday call the ogm thursday call um uh we had somebody um uh somebody fairly new coming on saying you know it he, he's super excited about um uh uh unearthing and reconstructing really early hypermedia systems. Um, so that's one of his favorite things to do. So we got to talking about um, Ted Nelson and Doug Engelbart. Um, and, you know, and I kind of, I, I asked a almost a rhetorical question in chat, you know, why, so why didn't we adopt the things that those people, you know, were talking about? And Part of the answer is like, oh, well, we did, you know, we use mouse, we use mice, you know, we have windows on our computer and it's like, you know, Doug was talking about the social computing and the way people like enhance their intelligence together, right? And, and the takeaway after 60 years or whatever is like, I can use a mouse and I have windows on my computer. It's like, we totally missed it, you know? So there's this weird thing where where people invent the future or people talk about inventing the future and then we the the people who try to understand it after that come up with the simplest smallest understandable thing and that's the thing that we get stuck on society gets stuck on these really easy to you know conceptualize you know hacks that you know were part of the original invention but weren't the point of the original invention at all Yeah, I, I feel like that theme has been coming up a lot this week, even Vincent and I and talking about the way I'm visualizing mapping things um, needs a database structure that it goes back to here are all the files and here are all the connectors and that's it, right? Yeah. And so I think, I, I guess if we're gonna circle back around or my mind is circling back around to blockchain, holochain, those things, Right. Is do you, do you guys have more of a technical perspective on it? Do you feel like it's all heading in that direction again? Like, is that what we're saying? Is that we're more and more people are recognizing that technology, as good as it's been, and how and and how it's an, even though it's enabled all these wonderful things, that these components have been missing in it for long enough now that it's almost like the thorn in our side. We need to kind of revamp and and figure this out is that kind of or am i saying does it resonate or i yeah not i i don't know i don't i don't feel like it does um uh the the takeaway that i have is that um social adoption a, a, like adoption of of complex things Actually, sometimes the things are just too complex. Uh, so Ted Nelson um, has a really beautiful vision of, of how to interconnect uh, information with Zan uh, Project Xanadu. Um, and, he's, and he has some cool kind of database-y database kind of information representation things that he did in there. Um, and there's a few things that are really cool, like transclusion is really cool, and two, two bi-directional links is really cool. Um, but I feel like when we went to implement stuff, we we either took took the too hard way to do that, so the people trying to invent Xanadu were really beating their heads against the wall for like 20 years, mm -hmm. um, or the or too easy. You know, it's like the the takeaway is like, oh, we could do hypertext, and then we could do HTML, and then we got you know, um, lots of broken stuff all the time. We don't have transclus transclusion, really. We don't have bidirectional links. Um, so that I, the, the takeaway I've got is that, uh, or another one, Doug Engelbart um, had, a, had a, a, a vision of people working together and kind of a hypothesis that you, if you got people grooving together 
um, with technology intermediating some of the, the hard parts of grooving together around information, then you could amplify human intelligence, multiply human intelligence, right? Um, so some of those things, some of the things that, that Doug or Ted talked about are kind of just pipe dreams. Um, um, and some of them are pipe dreams that kind of inform what you should be looking for into the future. And we're unrolling that really slowly. It's, it, it takes decades and decades to kind of unroll the, the possibilities that they were kind of imagining. And, and then another thing that happens is we, we implement what they invented rather than the, working on, this, on the solution that they were inventing towards. Um, this is another thing that happens. This is a, a classic product design thing. Um, if you, and it happens a lot in software. Um, if uh, somebody comes to a developer and says, I know exactly what I want. Um, I have this problem. I have the solution. I've thought this through the solution in my head. This is the solution. And um, th there's an old art and, and science that we used to use called requirements analysis, which I think is called something else at this point. But um, requirements analysis is going, OK, um, that sounds like a really cool thing. And I get how that solves your problem. Tell me more about the solution and the problem. And the requirements analyst, what she does is takes apart the problem into the real pieces of the problem. She doesn't really look at the solution that the person came up with because it's going to be crap because they're not a product designer. Um, and then they and then they they go back with a team and they actually design a better solution than than they had. That it's it's a constant thing that people express problems as solutions. Um, so there's. Uh, there's kind of the same thing that happens where Ted Nelson or Doug Engelbart were expressing in meta meta a couple levels up or something like that. They were expressing a problem and they had a solution. It's not the only or the best solution necessarily. Um, but then we, we implement it like it is like, that's the thing, you know, we, we get on this Holy grail track to the solution rather than expanding the, the, the problem statement better. So, you, you had a question there, you know, blockchain, whole chain, whatever, blah, blah, blah. There's the um, uh, blockchain a bit is a, is a solution looking for a problem. Um, there is a problem uh, of decentralization, um, decentralization and federating information and, and, you know, privacy and security and all those kinds of things. Um, uh, there are, um, uh, there's a lot of good in the the various kinds of the, the various blockchain solutions have invented a lot of cool things um, that it's going to take us a while to figure out what's what's important and what's not important and how to use it. Um, and the competing technology thing, it's kind of like um, uh, this is another age old thing about standards or something like that, where um, uh, the text that we use, um, Unicode and, and um, uh, UTF, UTF and uh, things like that is based on an earlier standard called ANSI, which is based on an earlier standard called ASCII. Um, ASCII and EBCDIC uh, were competing standards at, at, you know, in 1960-something, 1970-something. Um, uh, VHS and beta is kind of the same thing. You end up with this standard, a uh, couple different standards of, of working and one ends up being the, the right one for, for various, um, sometimes good and sometimes completely arbitrary reasons. And then you, a lot of times what we do is build on old standards to make new standards. So EBCDIC versus ASCII was a real question. Um, but as soon as ASCII more or less won, um, then, you know, then we had to figure out, well, ASCII doesn't quite work for these solutions, so for these problems, so we need ANSI. So then we need Unicode and, you know, and all of that is built on ASCII. Um, same thing with railroad gauges is another standard that we like to talk about. Um, you know, uh, how do you how do you buy and sell and lay railroad track and make sure that the tracks are the right 
right distance apart, right? Where are they that distance apart? Um, or the 19 inch rack. <laughs> or a 19 inch rack, yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. I don't know that story, Bill. I don't know the story about. No, I have to look look it up. You've got to had, up. Yeah, I know. I had a response from what Wendy was saying earlier, and what you were saying because I'm reading this history book. I'm reading. I mean, it's hundreds. I mean, it's, I don't know. It's like six hundred pages. I'm probably going to read it again because. But the thing that happened in the 18th to 19th century, people were trying to figure out how to. I mean, it's where the idea of a nation state came from there wasn't there, you know it was like constructed by people just like us literally <laughs> just put it together and then there was a lot of pushback because there are all the established hierarchies both ecclesiastical from people who owned a lot of land there's all these this kind of uh existing uh, it was an infrastructure of how power was shared and stuff and uh, and uh, what happened, you know, with uh, the Enlightenment thinkers and people who then decided to, you know, mostly in the UK and Scotland, that we're going to rethink, you know, political systems. I mean, you know, we're living one of the, you know, we're living an instance of one of those. Um, this historian says it was great. It was really, except they replaced one hierarchy with another one. Only it's based on, like now we have this hierarchy in our country, which is like really skewed in this weird money-centered way. And the thing that I've been seeing when I started to get involved with, uh, well, many of you and with, even with Kiko Lab and stuff, it's like we're in the position of people in the, from the like 1790s to the 1830s of trying to like redo how we actually organize as humans into workable, sustainable, you know, put together the systems that will allow us to actually live and sustain the planet we live on. Because the existing ones, you know, if we just do more of that, it's just, you know, we know where that's headed. I mean, we can see the either the edge of the cliff or the brick wall or both of them. Um, so I think some of these, this stuff about, I know I got cranky about like trying to do peer to peer, but that's like an experiment. If we did, if we sent decentralized, what would the experience of, you know, living there be like? And I think partially the push in blockchain and some of the pushback, there's a company here in Austin that actually manages borrowing and lending in Bitcoin and stuff. And, it's called Unchained Capital. And I met one of the owners a long time ago. And uh, he just said, this is going to change the way you think about ownership. Because, you know, it's not tied to you. Like, you know, if I go to the bank, somebody like, you know, does something weird with my bank account, I can usually prove, yeah, no, that wasn't me. In the blockchain, I, you know, it's like I better have enough either multi signal whatever I need to prove something, but that system takes away the, the, or changes how we look at ownership of some of these things. So I think we're really, I mean, I don't know. If, uh, we're in a very um, uh, formative stage of trying to figure out if we're not gonna organize in these, you know, capitalist money driven, power driven hierarchies, how are we going to organize? I think that's, you know, I, well, that's it for now. <laughs> You're muted. Thanks, Phil. Um, I have a short story. Maybe it's, maybe, I don't know how short it is. But anyway, I uh, so I, I got into a clean NFT uh, marketplace, Hika Mook, um, which is a lot of fun. Um, uh, I, I always love falling into new marketplaces that are that aren't like overly overly manipulated yet, I guess. And uh, he could he could no H E N isn't yet. Um, so it's it's interesting watching the market dynamics as they start to grow and in, in a early market. Um, but 
but uh, so I, I, I made this announcement on, I, you know, I, I sent an email to, I think, the OGM list and another private list that I've been on for a long time. And somebody on that list said, OK, Pete, I get it. I, I, I can walk through the steps you talked about, setting up a wallet, setting up a blah, 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 you know, like, and I, I could buy one of the pieces that you have, right? Turns out that he was thinking of buying not one that I made, which would have made me tickled pink, but uh, one of the ones that I had bought and, and have available for resale. But anyway, he's like, so what happens if I, if I buy that thing that you have? Um, uh, and it's an interesting question, and the the big NFT marketplaces have answered this question or not answered it for a while. But with HEN, um, the whole thing, I, 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 one of the things I did was I went to go out and look at the docs. You know, what does the marketplace itself say about buying and selling stuff? What, you know, what's actually help uh, happening? And it's not documented. The 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 documentation doesn't say anything about the you know, the praxis of buying and buying and selling, right? And even the interface, it doesn't say buy this, you know, buy this NFT, it says collect this NFT. Um, so I'm thinking about it. And the, the answer I ended up writing, I, and I think I haven't posted this anywhere else except this private list, now I should. Um, it's like, I don't, I don't think of it as buying something, I think of it as collecting something. And it turns out um, all the art artworks are stored on IPN, uh, IPFS. So they're publicly available. They're going to be there forever, probably. Um, and it's not like you can't go out and copy the ones that, that you fancy, right? You can just copy them to your computer and then you have the same enjoying uh, uh, viewing experience as somebody who's collected it. But what I wrote was, well, when you collect something, it's kind of like you're supporting the marketplace, you're supporting the, the artist, you're supporting the secondary market where you probably bought it from you might not have bought it from the original artist um, and collecting makes sense you're collecting essentially the artist's signature of something and you're saying that i want this in my collection on this marketplace you're not saying that i want this piece of art because in the day and age where where digital objects are infinitely replicable and are on a kind of a blockchain -y thing forever Owning a piece doesn't make sense, right? You're you're collecting it. You're you're saying that I'm a collector of this artist, and that's the that's the whole thing. So it really it really felt like, you know, I had a friend who asked, you know, Pete, what am I buying? And it's like, yeah, that doesn't even make sense when you're talking about digital artifacts. You're you know you're curating a collection. That's what you're doing. So. That, that change of what it means to be, you know, um, part just participating in a market and, you know, what, what we used to call buyer and seller means it doesn't even make sense anymore, kind of. <laughs> That's a good joke. Hang on a second. I want to let my dog come and lick my feet. <laughs> I love that that's in the recording. <laughs> it's not about technology, it's about dogs. What are dogs? No, never mind. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> I've been watching uh, this Turkish show, um, El Turu, on Netflix, and uh, horses, like, were the first time, or one of the first times in nature where we actually, like, like we decided to basically use horses as a technology, like as, you know, as weird as that sounds, like horses were a technology, an early technology that like, you know, basically for war, for transporting goods, for travel. Um, and like part of our like perspective of like, you know, conquering nature comes from like, like that's one of the first examples of like, yeah, we can conquer nature. Like horses are just another animal that we could, use as a tool um i thought that was a really interesting perspective um along with that stirrups um that uh, were a huge massive invention um they were like the nuclear bomb of the time um because if you're just sitting on a horse and you don't have any any stirrups 
uh, you can't shoot a bow very well. You're bouncing around on your horse as you're chasing after the, the good guys or the bad guys, whatever, whatever side you're, you think you are on. Um, but as soon as you've got a saddle and stirrups, you can stand up enough to stabilize your body enough to shoot well. And it was like this massive, you know, um, I think it was the Mongols that invented that and, and just wiped out everybody else who didn't, didn't have that invention yet. It's kind of like inventing machine guns or something like that. The saddest story from this big history book is that the reason that the Europeans and the North Americans came to dominate basically the world and deliver how we all dress and all this other is that they just were the best at fighting at war. Yeah. They just yep. generated war machinery that other people were like, the Chinese were like, rot roll. <laughs> we have some work to do here. I'm going to put a long quote into the chat because it sparked from what Wendy said. I just read this this morning. I was trying to find a place for it on Mattermost, but I don't, I couldn't figure out. It's, a, it's the end of a long, a little essay on uh, a moral argument for basic income. But this little, I mean, it's kind of long, but it just struck me as like, I love the last sentence, you know, before we put a human on Mars, before a car drives itself across the country, we ought to figure out how to guarantee each person access to a dignified life. First. Yeah, right. We could, we could do I that. I would get our priorities so kind of out of whack. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I guess kind of in the underneath all the questions and conversation, some a thought's been occurring to me especially when we were talking about innovation, right? There's that, there's that flow of creativity and innovation through human experience, through, through history. And sometimes there, there are significant turning points. And those are the ones that we were just talking about, right? Stirrups, partnerships with horses, um, the printing press, right? Things like this. And there are certain innovations that are not possible until that previous thing is invented. So this is kind of a, a baked, a big and kind of baked question. I don't, I don't know if this is an appropriate question, but it's pressing in my mind is what we are trying to create. Is it one of those things? And what, and I mean, we all know that every time we have these conversations, whether it's Kiko Lab or OGM or, or Flotilla, we, we all, I think, resonate with the fact that we're talking about something important. And it's a little bit at the edges, so we can't quite get our hands around it. We know it involves collab collaboration, that we can't do it alone, that we all have a piece, that it's bigger than any one of us. And the thought I keep having is, am I waiting for the thing to be built until I can do my thing? Or am I, being, am I helping to build the thing that will be the turning point? <laughs> I guess. And so that was, to me, the nature of the question, like holochain blockchain, does that need to be figured out before the rest of us can start iterating on our piece of it? Are we working in parallel? Are we getting... So Vince and I were talking a little bit about this yesterday too. It's just something in my mind as I start to put, as I start to, I, I'm finding myself now that I have more time starting to narrow in on where I'm going to be putting my time and energy. And I want to put it in the right spots for the right reasons and be mindful about it and not just start to go down rabbit holes, which is easy, very easy to do, right? Or start to get really busy, which is also very easy to do. I'd like to try and keep the bigger picture. So I'm searching for any insights to what that picture, bigger picture is. I hope that made sense. Yeah, unfortunately, I think, I think the answer to your question about, you know, it's not an either or, it's both. Because we don't have an option as humans to like wait. We just not, we're not constructed that way. And certainly not in our society. So we're going to do a lot. And just reading this history about, I mean, there were conversations all around the world in the 1780s to the 1820s. They didn't have, even have a telegraph. You said, you know, people writing and delivering stuff on ships, and they were all talking about the same thing. We just happen to have a lot better communication, which means maybe we can avoid spending too much time in a rat hole. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you can really do something that's completely like different 
without, you know, going down a bunch of, you know, finding out is that a dead end? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For now, looks like it. Or for me, yeah. So, I mean, so, so right. Same it, imbued, and the answer is there's nothing, there's nothing obvious we're missing at this point. We really are pursuing down the paths that are known to us and will either be successful in some way or it'll backfire in some way or it'll end in some way, right? And we'll, we just got to keep figuring it out, which is fine. Um, I'm just recognizing, you know, I'm, just, I'm putting out there and being vulnerable in the sense that I know what I don't know. And so I'm asking questions to see if other people know it. And if they don't know it, great. Okay, then we all don't know it and that's fine. But if there's a piece that <laughs> would be helpful to know, I want to make sure I know it before I, before I waste time, you know? Mm -hmm. There's another, there's a framework that I just will mention quickly. Um, the three horizons framework by Bill Sharp. Um, and so it's basically a model for creating a, like, how do you create like, you know, global change, like a shared vision? Well, um, it turns out that like sometimes you need like technologies that are kind of like really early adopter technologies and then they might fail and then people might migrate to the next thing which is like that kind of like the bridge like you know some technologies are like a bridge between the early adoption technology and then what ends up being the kind of like long-term sustainable thing that people are using right so like i've i've described like the current iteration of trove is like kind of like a bridge technology it's like it's going to die at some point and either turn into something else or but it's still a necessary component because without that bridge you can't like get to the end goal and so like you know everyone's like peace like some people's peace is to like be the pioneer and just to like you know kind of go into the uncharted territory and then other people is like to build roads to that uncharted territory and then other people is to come on the railroad and then to like plan out the long term like how are we going to actually set this all up um so yeah i think i think it's okay to be working on either a piece that like is ahead of your time it's also okay to work on a piece that's dying like there's a lot of companies right now that are like going to be obsolete in like 10 years and so um what they should be doing is like basically like they're more efficient right now in the current term. So it's actually like better for them to keep operating until we have the road and until we have the, 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 new, the new system to switch over to. And the hope is that we can figure out an economic like, you know, relationship in, in a way where companies are not like trying to be the, like if they're the um you know the kind of late stage like this is gonna die like they need to know that <laughs> and they they can't try to hold on for too long when their system is no longer efficient so i think that's the problem and there's like some pretty cool videos on youtube about the um the three horizons framework with like different graphs and charts that kind of explain it more but yeah that that came up in uh what you were saying wendy yeah thank you that's a great way to think about it appreciate mm -hmm. that yeah. um I, another one I think is uh, innovator's dilemma, and then another one is uh, crossing the chasm. Oh yeah, right. Mm -hmm. um, I so so um, so what for what it's worth, Wendy? It's uh, stuff like um, decentralization, block all the blockchain stuff. Um, it feels a lot to me like uh, when we we all of us when we all invented the internet back in you know the early nineties. So there was a time before the internet. Um, uh, we, I was doing a ton of BBS stuff. Um, a lot of it is actually the same, the same, you know, the the same kind of activities we used to do before the, there was an internet. Um, we did them on BBSs, um, and uh, actually there was pretty good decentralization technology back then um, that got lost to the sands of time uh, once we invented the internet and everybody was always connected rather than. Uh, never connected. Um, but then there's lots of like uh, lots of lots of trying to figure out what is this going to be for and lots of my solution is better than your solution um, and I'm going to spend a lot of money in, in developing my solution that you can't spend you know so maybe my solution will win 
um, and lots of that kind of stuff. Um, one of the questions that you didn't ask that I used to ask myself all the time was what happens when, uh, when somebody of bad intent wants to use the technology that I'm developing, right? Um, they want to use it to, to wage war. They want to use it to oppress people. You know, um, uh, do I want those people as clients or clients of clients? Um, or do I want to figure out a way to, uh, to thwart that? Um, so I think the I I loved the the way you expressed the questions, and I want I'm looking forward to going back to the recording and and listening to those again, and maybe 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 being able to write something more. But um, when you're in the thick of it, you kind of have what you need is kind of a gut feel for what you think works um, and the bets that you want to place. So right now, you could. Uh, you could make a bet that decentralization is really important. And then what you do is you spend your time. So that's one of the small bets I have. And so that's why I play around with an NFT marketplace, or that's why I play around with um, decentralized messaging. Um, because it's like, this is important and I want to know more about it and I want to help it grow and I want to describe it to other people. Um, if it's, you know, if I think it's useful and I think if, if it's describable, um, so part of it is kind of betting on, on a future. Um, part of it is looking for the really hard problems. The hard problem that we've got is not so much technology. It's, it's all sociological, right? Um, why do people hate each other? And why do people form up into these cohesive gangs? And, um, uh, you know, why, why do some people decide that they should lord over other people and get away with it. And what are the big structures? So for me, I guess, having gotten older, um, the the structures where I'm looking for leverage get have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So um, right now, the the things that are killing the planet are are the structural are structural things like hypercapitalism, which is you know it's and and the way i think of it is it's a thing that has co-evolved with humans so for me um there's hyperscale social structures that live on top of humans and we don't have a lot to do with how capitalism works um capitalism has fought to um inherit the the earth from feudalism which fought to inherit the earth from you know, uh, city states or religions or something like that. And so I, it, it's funny to me uh, at my age and at this point in history that <clears throat> people think we're actually in control of stuff and people think we can make choices between, you know, structural systems. Really the structural systems are the ones that are, are playing the game. And, you know, we're little pawns inside inside a game of nation states and and whether capitalism is the right thing or not hyper capitalism um so i don't know so if you want the most leverage i think <laughs> i think that the thing that you do is you figure out how to um uh deconstruct uh um the toxic capitalism structure um, and it seems pretty easy, I, like it's, it's conceptually pretty easy for me to, to explain or explain to myself at least why that happens, right? Um, when, you make, um, uh, when you make the rules of the game such that the winners of the game make the, the rules for the game, um, you're going to have this constantly, you know, you're, you're basically what we did is back in, you know, back starting in the 1800s, we set up a game so that the winners of the game were the people who decided on the rules of the game. And so just by law of the physics, you're going to end up with billionaires making decisions. And then the billionaires are, are humans. Some of them make good decisions. Some of them make bad decisions. Some of them are nasty people and, you know, they throw around billions of dollars of stuff. Right. Um, so the, the cook brothers or Murdoch, have huge influence on your life and my life, not for any good reason, except that they are the winners of this. You know, they're the, you know, they're they're the instrument. Actually, they're the instrument of this toxic capitalism. And you know, 
So, yeah, so this history book I'm reading it says, yeah, we're exactly at the point now where all that's up for questioning in a more substantial way. Because all the men that decided how to organize who, like who votes, were pretty clear about how to do that. Right. And it was only men with property. So it was a very deliberate, no matter what kind of highlight, highfalutin phrases John Stuart Mill wrote when push came to shove about who gets the right to vote, he goes, this group. So, you know, we're only human here. But uh, <laughs> well, and ultimately, from what you both were saying, you know, it goes back to kind of what you posted, Bill, earlier and was talking about, you know, so if systems have gotten so out of whack, right, can, can we at least agree that, like, we need to solve the basic human, human right to, you know, live a life? <laughs> so, yeah, well, that's that's going to take some time. because not prioritizing, every, right. Well, yeah. the people are behaving as if they really, at least where I live, as if they don't believe that. Yeah. They actually don't. Well, I, right. There's the belief <laughs> side of it. And then there's also the, let's say we all actually did believe that. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to reorganize an entire, you know, structure of society around that being the priority. Yeah. But, you know, people have done, people used to, I mean, there were, and there may still be places on earth where societies like, you know, are run by, tribal councils, which may be made up of like as only men, but actually I think historically that's not always the case. Mm. You know, so there is a different way to, I mean, a society or a large group of people at some point needs a way to be able to make certain decisions mm -hmm. in the face of whatever, you know, hey, you know, the lake went dry. Well, ruh -ruh, what are we going to do now? You know, rather than every person just, you know, go off and find water. Most, I mean, it I, I seems to be, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I, I was just going to add to that, that I learned once that indigenous cultures had two kind of or, um, governing bodies and the women were the ones that decided to go to war, not the men, because it included considerations like children and the sick and the elderly and the, <laughs> like, and are we really going to do this or not? And I just think that's and when I heard that, I remember thinking that was interesting. I never researched it, so I don't know the, all the details. Well, this book it. may, may, I may find this book is just a freaking gold mine that I'm reading, but there is, a, so there are, we have, there are examples in human history of organizations that aren't organized the way we are now. Yeah. So the question As examples, is, at least, well, to, to consider, is that what you mean? Yeah, in the 1990s, people thought that neoliberal capitalism, there literally was a word, Tina, there is no alternative. Mm. People like Tony Blair and Bill Clinton actually used those words. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what? You know, one of the world's most accomplished uh, animal trainers and especially dog trainers she writes on her wrist she goes i write this in ink on my wrist when i go out with dogs it's like i might be wrong <laughs> because you know if you're walking down the street if you have a dog and you're walking down the street and your dog like you know stops or looks or you go oh we'd like you know oh the fire truck came around the corner you got afraid you have no idea you have no i, I mean i have this nice dog sitting next you have no idea what's going on in their mind So, you know, and I think basically if we can all realize that we might be wrong, it doesn't stop you from trying, but it might keep you from just like, well, that didn't work. I think I'll do some more of it harder. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that, de that Einstein definition of san insanity, right? Insanity. Yeah. I don't know if it came from him, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Same idea. I'm, I do that all the time. Just like a programmer. Well, I'll just try that again. Like, wait, why? Right, right, right. right. <laughs> I'll try just it. Hitting third. my head against the wall felt great the first time. So I did that. I did that. I time. did that yesterday. Trying to get this peer-to-peer -peer, like connection going. 
did the same thing many well, times. And there's, <laughs> and there's a benefit to persisting. And the, and the question is, when is the wisdom? Where's the wisdom to say, okay, I think this one's done and time to move on to something else, right? And, uh, so and that goes back to what you were saying, Pete, about you know, following your gut. I think this has promise. I think this has potential and um, I'm going to nurture it. That's where I'm going to spend my time. And, um, and it's a gut feel. Yeah, so that's why we should be, you know, take Vincent at his word and use Trove. Let's just put it to, put it into practice. Start mm -hmm. to depend on it. Mm -hmm. Same with like <laughs> trying to use wikis. Let's just try and depend on it. Stop with the like, they're only for a few. No, this is how we do things. I was just, that's why I was, I was actually just asking in the chat. I don't know if you saw it, Bill. I was like, I'm on my phone, so I can't download the chat file. But I was wondering if someone could uh, maybe screen share and just download the file and drag it onto the event page. I did a cool thing with Pete's uh, link chainsaw um, that I, I don't know. If I, I don't know. Has everyone seen it? Um, I've heard about it. I haven't seen it, but I think you might have shown something recently. I'll, uh, I'll share my screen. Sure. Yeah, I think Pete shared something last week mm. or the week before. So basically, you just drag it where it says um, you can um, if you save the file and then you up when it, where it says click to upload um, Zoom chat file. Yep. Actually, click, I don't see click that or um, it's uh, let's see, all the way on the right, call notes file, automate links. Yep. You have to either drag it there or click to upload and then find the file. We definitely should save this chat stream somewhere. It's freaking gold in here. <laughs> so drag it, drag it there. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, and then if it works, you should see a blue bar at the top in the chat. Yep, so that worked. Um, and now it's going to be running in the background. Um, and then I got a nice blue banner there. Cool. So yeah, the links are being great. added. Um, now, I, so there's two places this goes now. So if you go to the event page, um, if you go all the way to the top and click view event. And one thing that um, someone will have to do, which I'm happy to do after, is go in and like any links that didn't have like a meta title, you can basically edit it and say like, oh, this was like a, a Zoom chat or this was like a cool thing we found, talked about. Um, but if you scroll down, there should be a library of all the links attached to the page. It's sweet. Um, and probably they're still That's being, fun. they're still being loaded, but. Uh, yeah, that's great. And then if you go to the um, flotilla group, this is a new thing that I um, recently just added, which it should be linked on the top. Um, in Explore or? Uh, where it says community hosts. Um, I think that's, there's a hyperlink right to the, the group there, flotilla gotcha. community. So basically because this event is hosted by flotilla, all the links are also automatically gonna be available in the links directory inside of the um, flotilla group. So if you go to like, if you're looking for a link for something, you can go to links and then, um, and then you could choose like a source for the links. And so I don't, I haven't tested if this works yet, but if you go to events uh, under the source, then it should show all the links that have been added to any flotilla event in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so it says you showing see. links from one flotilla FTA event. And then um, if you click the drop down, you should be able to filter by the events. Um, so if there was like a specific date that you know something was posted. Um, this, this one, right? That lets you filter by the source. So like, for example, gotcha. YouTube videos or Mattermost files or massive yep. wiki pages. And then the one on the right is the event, I believe. Oh. Somehow that looks to me like a type a type in mm -hmm. box. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna jump off. I just want to know that we're gonna save the chat from this. The links are yeah. great, but the rest I want the text as well. Yeah, 
Yeah, okay. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, I'm going to go into. Are your feet washed now? No, no, he didn't do that. He's still learning. Or see, now he's jumping up. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Uh, yeah. that, I'm trying that's to, really good. I'm trying that to train cool him to him, train so. him to sit down and not jump in my lap. So it's got a way to go. <laughs> Vincent, that's super cool. Yeah, it is. It's really well good. Done. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited to start. Like, it, the thing is, like, when you when you use it for like, you know, one event, it's like totally different from if you use it for like 20, like having like, imagine having the links for like, you know, 20 events, like it's almost like a completely different design criteria. And so oh. it's, it's weird sometimes to like, um, and we were talking about this a bit yesterday, like to design something for like 20 events but then when you like look at it for one you're like oh this doesn't really look right like I'm, i can only filter by like one event right so it's like it's always weird to like know where to set the scope and when to say like okay i'm gonna like hide this thing until there's three events and then once there's 20 we're gonna like show like the advanced filters that <laughs> are like useless when there's one event so that's the only thing that's been really difficult is like um the kind of bootstrapping of like i know there's gonna be a lot more data and there's like a totally different design you need as the data like scales basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's fair, <laughs> that's fair. And that's gotta be frustrating as the, uh, and trying to put things out. You're creating, and I know you're such a good, you're so good at thinking ahead too. So I know for you, there's a bunch of other stuff that you're thinking of and you're not sure which, it's hard to know what to put first and second and third and how much of each, each feature too. Yeah, for sure. But appreciate the, the live testing that makes it, <laughs> uh, that helps so much. You're doing a great job. Really. Yeah, you are. I really appreciate it. I'm going to sign off, everyone. Have a great week. Uh, Thanks, Bill. Great Thanks, week. Bye, Bill. Yeah, guys, have a great weekend. Do we keep chatting or do we fold up the tent and go home? I think I'm feeling pretty complete. Is there anything going on for you, Pete? You want to share? Um, actually, maybe I don't know. Um, but I've got I've got another story to tell. Um, uh, now I feel like an old person telling stories. But um, <laughs> another thing to think about is where the technology goes. Um, so, <clears throat> so I was doing hypertech stuff in nine, in the eighties. Um, and BBS stuff in the eighties and in the eighties. Um, and then there was this weird thing called CERN and this weird thing called the World Wide Web, um, which was very, very basic at the time. And, you know, things like HTML. Um, somewhere around there, I remember, so if you can imagine a time before the internet, um, when mm -hmm. information came on, in newspapers on the driveway and magazines, and that's pretty much it. That was mm -hmm. that was current information, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and one of the the three network news news things, maybe. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I remember looking in the back of magazines, and they used to have like ads. Um, so we, without Amazon, you know, you'd have ads for. I, um, ICs or computer kits or, you know, um, uh, terrariums or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I was, I remember terrariums. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, all the <laughs> uh, all the stuff that you would do with Amazon, right? You used to like um, actually, what you'd do is you'd see a little ad for terrariums in the back of, you know, um, I don't know, Boys Life or whatever, um, and then you'd <laughs> um, you'd write a letter to the company saying and enclose you know like a like a couple stamps can I have your catalog right because you knew that that one wasn't the one that you wanted you want the fancier one or you know the you know they, they showed you a terrarium for turtles and you need the ones for rats or whatever right. um, 
so then, you know, a couple weeks later, a month later, two months later, you'd get the catalog and then you could whip through it. And, and that was, that was the Amazon experience back then. So mm -hmm. I was thinking all those classified ads somehow are going to end up on the computer. And how does that work? You know, um, and somehow we're going to replace this cycle of the news happens um it gets written up the day before or overnight kind of and it gets typeset and then there's big printing presses that run at 2 a.m you know making papers that get delivered to doorsteps that that cycle of distributing the information how does that work in you know in 10 years from you know 1985 or whatever um and and then and then how are going how are people going to adopt that right are they going to um are they going to want something that looks like a newspaper are they going to um, want pdfs that they download every day that then they can print out and then they can read at the breakfast table like that's what you, how you consume the news right is at the breakfast table with a big paper open up and how do you fit the the big pages down into smaller pages and all of that kind of stuff right so all of those questions kind of swirling around you really don't know the answers to them and you know you wouldn't have guessed that um there's a bunch of stuff that that you know like one of the weird things that happened one of the really weird things that happened was that nobody wanted to pay for internet stuff because it was all crap right i mean not the kind of crap that we have today but there was like i'm not going to pay for a newspaper you know when i can get you know 100 like 30 40 50 100 pages every day on my front doorstep for you know 50 cents a day or something like that why would i pay you know so a, a newspaper on the web has like 10 10 pages or something like that and then they don't they don't update very frequently and they're not you know they look crappy and all that kind of stuff they're they're not as good as my paper newspaper so for the first 10 or 15 years of the web everything had to be free um because it was crappy right so then we ended up now today we pay for that significantly because um everybody got used to free stuff on the web which meant that you couldn't ask for subscriptions which meant that you had to figure out the revenue model some other way which meant that you had advertising, advertising. Right? so we could have you know if if we did um in britain in the olden days i don't know if they do this anymore but everybody paid a tax for their tv right um every household whether you had a tv or not you paid the tv tax you know and then that generated revenue for the bbc which generated high quality content right um ad, ad free right so we could have done that with the internet um maybe um except that it was so crappy all the time that maybe we couldn't have <laughs> but but anyway if we had done that um advertising and then the bastard children of advertising disinformation and you know meme tape takeover and all that kind of stuff it wouldn't have happened right um so before that you know like you have to think through the revenue models and the and the use models what are people used to and what can they adopt and what can't they adopt and you know where is this going what is what is it actually useful for um, the web turns out to be useful for people chit chatting and for for people to look up um, stuff on Wikipedia, maybe, and to blast ads to everybody, um, get them hooked on a Facebook feed, and then just keep churning ads into that. And that's what the the web is useful for, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm not sure that's what I would have guessed, or I I even would have wanted, you know, yes. back from 1985 yeah same so same thing with blockchain you know where is it going what's it going to be used for how's it going to be misused how is it going to be adopted poorly um how does it Rem solve the big problems of the day be seen right yep yep and well and some of those things you can actually influence right <clears throat> so if we had thought about it at the time i think we could have influenced uh, it, it would have been a great experiment to start paying for the web a lot sooner um and that could have been done um uh when the web was still new and pliable and things like that 
Yeah. So my, my husband in his career worked for Reader's Digest and Consumer Reports, then Hearst, and now, um, and then a web company that sold ads through pop-up browsers, like the word, right. And then, yeah, we're not doing that. And then, <laughs> and then back to Simon and Schuster, right. And in all those jobs, it's always been about subscription because the, 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 um, publishing companies were the first to feel the significant effects of the lost revenue coming from lost advertising, you know, lost yeah. advertising and trying to figure out how to make money. We had to go to the subscription model. Yeah. And so he was part of companies that found a way to make the subscription model profitable because they had rich content. Yeah. Right. And, and so it's, it, I completely you know, I'm on board with your entire description, right? I think that's exactly, I'm, I, I'm not sure whether I believe that it wouldn't, that if people had made different choices, whether it would have gone more subscription and we would have been more willing to pay. I think advertising is a very compelling business model for short, especially for short-term gain. Even the subscription model is about renewals. So you, you it's a long, it's more of a long-term thing. And if you're talking about building technologies, which costs an incredible amount of, you know, up, upfront investment and, and, and somehow our willingness to invest in companies that aren't even profitable. Right. And then it's such a short term view of return, right. It's, it's trying to get the quick fix, you know, and the, and the pill for the, for the disease and the quick answer for my problem and the, right. And I think that was all so compelling, no matter what area of our lives we're talking about and technology just being one of them, that I think it was easiest. And we were talking about that before too, easiest to go into a advertising model, you know? And so a lot of, why wouldn't you do that? Right. It's there and it's easy and it's staring at you. Oh, and now we can provide you with all the data to make it even more effective because everybody knows that you waste a lot of money in marketing. So now you don't even have to waste as much money in marketing. You can get to your, right? So from the business side, it, of course it keeps making sense. But the further we get down, the further, the more, the further away we get from the things that matter. <laughs> I think um, that all makes sense. I, th I think we could have nipped it in the bud actually. Yeah. Um, uh, except um, you bring up a really good point, which is businesses are incentivized to the way we set up business and we're incentivized to make really short-term decisions, which are just, you know, usually stupid. Um, yeah, and so, my husband's career, I mean, he's worked for companies that have been owned privately and companies that have been owned publicly. And over the years, especially in the last 20 years, how the focus from Wall Street has gotten shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter yeah. focus. Um, it's been interesting to see how the cultures shift in those companies. Yeah. Right. And, and the differences between the two, because the private companies, one of the big differences is the private companies are willing to take a long term view and invest in things that may not pay out for a couple of years. And the short term companies aren't. Yeah. You know, the, the public companies really can't. And, and so it just means it forces upon them, even if they don't want it, different decisions like like firing half of their people because it creates a gain for the, for that quarter. Yep. Right. And losing all that intellectual capital yep. and, and feeling like they have to anyway, you know, it's that kind of thing, which just in, isn't common sense, yep. but makes total sense within the infrastructure. So I don't know. Anyway, we're getting off on different things. <laughs> no, I think that's actually, <laughs> to me, it's like, all interrelated. Key, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, so the, the, the problem there, like, isn't the company that made a decision it's the it's the framework the structural you know setup that that's the right way to to um make decisions that affect people right yeah and also i think the small little things when we're talking you just mentioned like we all in some ways have a role to play to push back a little bit too there's plenty of companies who were advised to say do it one way you know, that would have benefited the short-term value of their company and decided to do it a different way, which benefited their employees. Yeah. And the, we don't talk about those stories a lot, but they are certainly out there. They're not the yeah. stories that we celebrate. We should be, <laughs> we should be sharing those and giving courage to more people to push back on that system. It yeah. would at least shave round the edges a bit, even yeah. if it doesn't get us out of the system. 
But again, that's to me, this is the kind of information when I think about sharing information and, and collaboration, what comes before that to help train our minds to want to do that are the stories of success that yeah. came from the collaboration that we don't share and we don't celebrate and we don't rise, you know, rise up on a pedestal, right? We rise up on this pedestal sits most of the people who burned every bridge, pissed everybody off and made $10 million. Ooh, I want to be just like that, right? Like, you know, it's like, <laughs> one area of their life is great and everything else is horrible. Yeah, I want to be just like them. You know, like those are the stories we tell and, um, and the ones that we've been trained to think are the best versions of the story. And so I think just sharing, having access to these other stories in and of itself. I know that's, it's done that for me, you know, you yeah. get, and it's shown in science too. They'll, they'll do te They've done tests where say college, college students being given a letter by a graduating college student saying, this is what it was like for me. This is how I got through it. And this is now my success, right? So somebody who's just beyond where you're at, basically saying, go for it. You can do this. The students that got those letters, were not just more successful in college, but they were more successful beyond, right? It's yeah. things like that, right? We just, it's so easy. <laughs> it's another, one of those low hanging fruits. The stories are everywhere. We just don't share them readily. That's not what, so. The irony is people end up spending more money on the long run on impulse buys than they would in the subscription itself. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Impulse buys and products that they end up not using or kind of using a little bit and forgetting about, I don't know. Yeah, I had a bad day. I just want to buy this thing. It'll make me feel better. <laughs> yeah. So nothing is free. Nothing in this world is free. So. Love is free. <laughs> That's, yeah, a quote. There you go. That's a quote from a movie. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I scheduled another call. Um, so I was going to head out to that. Sounds when good. You know, yeah. Great. Um, but I didn't know too if I mean Avin could hop on here if you want to just end the recording and he can meet Peter too briefly. I don't know. So he, sure. He that works for, that works for me if it works for Peter. Yep. Sure. <laughs>